in my last video, we talked about how to say the word kvike. But what is kvike? Where does it come from? Why should we care? So, what is kvike? It's a group of very genetically varied Saccharomyces cerevisiae yeast strains from Norway, or blends, really. It is not the name of ale made with kvike, so please don't call your kvike fermented beer a kvike, like I made a kvike. Kvike refers only to the yeast. Now, if you do want to talk about traditional Norwegian farmhouse ales themselves, then the proper word is maltal, though different towns have different names for their traditional ales. For instance, in Horndal, they call their traditional farmhouse ale Kornel, hence their festival named the Norsk Kornel Festival. Anyway, kvike are yeast blends that have been used and passed around among family and neighbors and communities in Norway for many, many generations, perhaps thousands of years, actually. They are brewer's yeasts, meaning that their use by brewers in Norway put evolutionary pressure on these yeasts. They are not wild yeasts. They are considered land race yeasts, meaning they're local, domesticated, traditional yeast strains, with the key word being domesticated. Domesticated. In Norway, kvike is pretty much always a blend of yeast strains. They don't really, you know, obviously have labs growing up single strains for them, or at least they didn't. Uh, in recent years, a guy named Lars Marius Garshall has been traveling around Norway, learning about kvike and traditional Norwegian farmhouse brewing. He is the guy who is responsible for bringing the existence of kvike and Norwegian farmhouse brewing to the attention of the world. It's through his blog that I first learned about kvike. Lars has been gathering samples of kvike blends and sharing them with labs and purveyors of brewer's yeast like Omega Labs and White Labs in the U.S., and what those labs do is they take those blends and they identify the single strain in the blend that they determine makes the best beer. And they grow up that standardized strain for selling to pros and homebrewers. So that's where all these new quite yeast strains such as Voss and Hornendal and Stranda and others are coming from. But they are different from the original Kvike that you find in Norway because those are standardized single strains unlike these blends that you'll find in Norway. So the big question is, what makes this yeast special? Why should we care? Well, quite strange share a few unique features that make them very, very special. One interesting genetic feature they share is that they can survive being dried and then rehydrated and pitched. There are packets of dry yeast out there, right, for brewers and bakers to use. But those go through an industrial process. With kvike, you can just scoop some off the top of a fermenting ale and allow it to dry naturally and then repitch it later and it'll work fine. You can use one of these cool kvike rings if you can find one. But yeah, if you try that with your typical Chico strains of brewer's yeast, you're not going to have much luck. However, the reason that kvike stra uh, strains are a game changer for the craft brewing industry is another unique feature. They can be fermented at ridiculously high temperatures, in some cases at over 100 degrees Fahrenheit or 38 degrees Celsius, without creating a bunch of off flavors. Many strains of kvike ferment pretty cleanly at these incredibly high temperatures, whereas most ale yeast is fermented at somewhere around 65 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. These kvike strains can ferment cleanly in the high 90s or even over 100 degrees. That is incredible. If you try that with most, most brewer's yeasts, your beer is going to have crazy fruity esters and probably harsh solventy nail polish remover acetone flavors. It just really isn't an issue with quike strains. And so, as we all know from high school chemistry, chemical reactions tend to happen faster when more heat is added. So the reason it's, it's exciting that quike strains can ferment so hot is that it also ferments crazy fast. I've done a few collab beers with pro breweries using quite strain since returning from Norway in late 2018. I've been kind of working to spread the word about this yeast. Um, I've done two double IPAs uh, with Almanac Beer Company in Alameda, an ESB with Freewheel in Redwood City, um, a Hazy IPA with Bear Bottle in San Francisco, and a Berliner Weiss with Laughing Monk in San Francisco. In every case... The beer has completed fermentation in just a few days. And in every case, the final beer was fantastic. 
I did uh, an 8.2% ABV double IPA with Almanac Beer Company using Omega Labs Hornendal Quike Strain. We called it Oslo Hot Chicken because Hen House Brewing was also a collaboration partner. Uh, we brewed that beer on a Thursday morning, and we were drinking it on Sunday night. It was in kegs and at accounts within seven days. Not only that, but it was freaking delicious. It was a fabulous Hazy double IPA. Just totally awesome. So that, my friends, changes the economics of beer making, period. I'm willing to go on the record saying that I predict that within a few years, most breweries will have adopted quike strains as their primary yeast choice for making typical non-phenolic ales. It's a big, big, I don't know, prediction, but I just don't see why a brewery would say no to being able to make beer in half the time. It's like, Boom. You start doing all your most popular releases with Quike, and congratulations, your brewery's capacity just doubled. Suddenly, typically sized local breweries start looking a little more like regional breweries in their potential output. Folks who are planning to build a brewery maybe don't need to go as big on their equipment expenditures. Um, and can you imagine just how much energy costs are saved? Imagine if you're a brewery located somewhere hot, like in Florida. And you no longer have to keep your fermenters at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. You no longer even have to chill your wort to below, say, 90 degrees after your boil. You just pitch your yeast, let it free rise up to, you know, potentially 100 degrees before you even need to start cooling things. So, I don't know. I've heard, I've heard about some of these strains working up to 104 degrees Fahrenheit or 40 degrees Celsius. And, and that is just incredible. It's a total game changer. So one question I see people asking online all the time is, will quike yeast strains contaminate my brewery? And the answer is no. Quike strains are typical Sac Cerevisae yeast strains, just like all the other typical brewer's yeast that you use to make your IPAs and other ales. It is not a wild yeast. Quike strains are POF negative, meaning they will not produce phenols in your beer like peppery, clove-like, or smoky flavors. And they are non-diastaticous, meaning they do not produce glucoamylase uh, to allow them to break down much longer chain starches and dextrins and like seriously dry the beer out like a Britannomyces yeast strain would do. They're just very typical and safe sack yeast strains to introduce into your brewery. So, what kind of flavors do quike strains produce? Quike strains tend to produce some fruity esters, but are relatively neutral in flavor. Like most sac strains, most quike strains will produce more esters if fermented at higher temperatures. But again, we're talking about, you know, ridiculously high temperatures here as compared to normal brewer's yeast. The great news is that most of the esters produced by quike strains are totally appropriate for popular craft beer styles like IPAs, American wheat beers, blondes, even English ales. The descriptions I've heard do vary, but I have some experience using several of the strains myself. The most common characteristic I've noticed from at least the Hornendal and Voss strains from Omega, um, they tend to have a mild citrusy orangey ester profile, sort of like Grand Marnier liqueur, but it can sometimes present as more tropical in character. Obviously, that works perfectly for many popular craft beer styles. Um, and another thing that's worth mentioning is that even though these are highly flocculent strains, the Hornendal strain in particular seems to work great for making hazy dry hopped IPAs. Obviously, it's going to take a few brews to dial it in using any new yeast strain, but I would encourage homebrewers and pros to get out there and get some quike strains and start experimenting. I really think quike could be a tidal wave of change for the industry, so why not be on top of it? Hey, thanks for hanging out. I'm Chris Cohen, the Beer Scholar. If you are interested in learning more about beer, maybe passing the uh, Certified Beer Server and Certified Cicerone exams, I've written the main study guides on the market for those exams, and you can get yourself a copy like thousands of others have done at thebeerscholar.com. And uh, thanks again. I will see you soon.